And so the, I think get rid of the nymphs in October, fish your dry flies, you can move the bug around, you can dead drift it, you can fish a big October caddis, but you also need to be looking at gray drakes, a parachute atoms is a great imitator for that. You can have really nasty cold days and be looking at blue winged dollops as well. So it's really awesome dry fly fishing. Low water means the fish don't have to move a million miles. Uh, that short wing stonefly, which is, is not a good flyer, has pushed fish to the edges. That was Chris Daughters providing some fall trout fishing bugs that you should be on the lookout for this season. The October Caddis and their friends today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. Please take a quick moment and share this episode with one other person that you think can use a blast of trout uh, goodness today. Uh, just click the link, the share link in your app down below and, uh, and share that. Just send a text message out to somebody right now and they should be able to click right through and listen to this one. It's a good one. Chris breaks down uh, the fall, fall trout fishing today, so definitely stay in on it. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsor. Togan's Fly Shop, providing superior products at an affordable price. An amazing resource for fly tying materials, tools, and fishing accessories. Since 2005, Togan's has been over delivering on price, service, and passion. And now it's time to discover the Togan's buzz for yourself. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Togan's to get started today. You support this podcast by clicking over to take a look at Togan's online. That's wetflyswing.com slash Togan's. T-O-G-E-N-S. Togans. Chris Daughters, owner of the Caddis Fly Shop, sheds a little bit of insight on what it takes to find trout in the fall. Uh, we focus on some of the upper parts of the Mackenzie River today and fishing out of a drift boat. We find out which October caddis he uses and how he fishes them, his favorite leader setup, which crosses over towards the Euro game. And we also find out what happened when uh, this blog post about fly names uh, went viral. Uh, so this is kind of an interesting thing that was kind of out, and uh, Chris describes his take on it, which is actually a really good one. I think it's a real positive take on everything there. So, um, yeah, so stay tuned for that one. Uh, this and the stonefly with a hermaphroditic tinge. So without further ado, here is Chris Daughters from caddisflyshop.com. How's it going, Chris? Doing very well, Dave. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for thanks for putting this together. Uh, uh, it took us a few seconds there to get the the audio together, but uh, we we got you on on the squad cast here uh, recording. So this is this is good. Uh, we're gonna jump into the the Caddis Fly Shop, uh, the Oregon Fishing Blog, and you know you guys are kind of leading the way down there in in Oregon, and you know I guess more towards the south and all that. But um, before we jump into that and a little bit on maybe uh, kind of fall fishing, talk about how you first got into fly fishing. Uh, I first got into fly fishing uh, actually with my father at uh, at the Caddis Fly, the same store that I ended up buying. Um, we both took a fly fishing course uh, from Bob Gard and Jeff Carr and a uh, bunch of guys, uh, great guys that were working at the shop at the time, um, and you know learned to cast in in the traditional sort of Mel Krieger short. Uh, but sweet fly fishing, fly casting course. It was about a six hour course. And um, I mean, honestly, right at, from there on, I remember my father buying a drift boat uh, and fishing the Mackenzie constantly. We were, we were already fishing the Mackenzie con with conventional tackle. But then when, once we got into fly fishing, uh, he quickly realized that when you're on the oars, you're not casting. So uh, got me on the oars and him up front casting. And that was uh, that was sort of the night. The next step was uh, suddenly I realized that I was guiding before I could drive, and uh, that that was fantastic. That was the that was the next part of that career. But I mean, I literally walked the, from school to the Caddis Fly from age twelve till I could begin to drive from school to the Caddis Fly, and uh, from that class uh, of casting took another course on um, tying flies, and then started tying commercial. El care caddis for nine dollars a dozen believe it or not uh, which was good which was great money at the you know 13 14 15 <laughs> so that was a blast so it was really the, the shop was really my support center 
Um, I was there more time than I was anywhere else. If I wasn't, if I wasn't at the river, I was at the shop and, um, it was a great experience then. And, and I still really enjoy it. No, that's cool. I didn't realize that, uh, there was somebody there. I didn't know the whole history on the shop. So, so the guys there, do you know a little bit of that history? Like when, when the shop actually, when those guys started it? Well, Bob and Kathy guard started in 1975. Um, uh, a little bit longer than a stone's throw away from the, where the shop is now, but we've been in four locations in and around downtown Eugene since 1975. We've been in the current location since 91, uh, which is on sixth Avenue. It's a, it's, it's a great, you know, uh, thoroughfare. So it's a good location. Um, yeah. So that the, the shop and the, and the history of the shop are uh, kind of ingrained into Eugene. I mean, all the local fishing clubs and, I've been really supportive and, and local community and, and, uh, hopefully we've, we've done the same with giving back as much as we can. So it's, yeah, it's, it's been a, a great environment for the caddis fly to be in since 1975. I and mean, we've had, there is another fly shop in town and of course there's a Cabela's and all the, all the same stuff that everybody else is, is experiencing, but, um, really have been fortunate to, you know, have all the best brands and names and support in the industry. So it's been, it's been a great situation. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you're, you know, the, well, the Oregon fly fishing blog too, right? I mean, you're well known that resource is out there for sure. All the videos and, you know, and, and the, the good resource there. So it's been, um, you know, it makes sense that you're, you know, you're one of the big names when people think probably, you know, in that area, if not, you know, the region. Um, so, okay. And so basically what year was that when you purchased, uh, took over the shop in 1996. So I was about 26 at that time. Um, and Bob was, re was ready to move on. I mean, I think he'd been into the, so that puts him at 21 years in, in retail. Um, and, and he was really involved throughout, you know, um, which is, which I think is, can wear on people. Um, I've been lucky to have a guys a little different circumstance. And like I said, I still really enjoy retail, but the, the, the store was, uh, you know, in, in great, in great shape, but no online presence, uh, and kind of the online thing in fly fishing was just kicking in. Um, and we, we actually had a brief partnership with, with another sort of more tech savvy person, uh, in the early two thousands. And then kind of started on our own in earnest in, in late 2007, 2008. And, and that was also about the same time that Oregon fly fishing vlog uh, kicked in. And that was a, a guy named Matt Stansbury, who's since moved to the Eastern United States, but is still a good buddy and, you know, still has some great advice. Uh, if I, if I ask him, <laughs> um, he's an awesome writer and, uh, he's still, he's still active in his own local community, but, uh, was really, uh, the, as as co-founder of Oregon Fly Fishing Blog, he he was, you know, a great guy and uh, got us, you know, involved in sort of conservation projects and contests and more, you know, so savvy internet stuff. Uh, and and I've had to learn all of that. You know, I I really honestly came in absolutely blind and and uh, that's that's been as as many of us have had to kind of grow with with that part of business world in the last 20 or, you know, 15 years or so, it's been, it's been fascinating. And, and who is that again that helped you with the, the online stuff? Well, he, Matt, Matt really helped me with Oregon fly fishing blog. And that was Matt who? Matt Stansberry. Okay. And, and he's, you can still find Matt. I mean, Matt is still writing a lot. Um, he's in North Carolina right now, but, uh, he's, he's just a fantastic writer. I mean, I would suggest to anybody that can find his stuff or of course there's a lot of stuff on Oregon fly fishing blog that people will know, but, uh, he, he's, he's just, he's really got a great style of his writing. And when we look at the blog, uh, you know, I, and I want to just touch on that just kind of quickly because I think it is a good resource. How, you know, how would you recommend if somebody wanted to find some topics, is it best just to start from the most recent stuff or is there a way to search? It sounds like there's many years of, of, of content there. Is there an easy way to find what you're looking for? Yeah, there is a, there is a search tab, um, that, that you can utilize, but there's also those, um, you know, where you can attribute or attribute the, the post to a topic and those topics are on the right hand side in a column. So they can be fishing reports, conservation, fly tying videos, 
Mackenzie River to Shoots River, Umpqua River. So you can you can see those and click on those, and that will kind of drill it down. Um, but but you can type in anything. I mean, you know, you can put in spay lines or sink dips or whatever matches or fishing reports, and that's gonna that's gonna filter it a little bit for sure. So if you wanted to search for, say, for example, uh, fall uh, fishing, fall trout fishing, October caddis or something like that, could you find some articles there? For sure. For sure. October caddis would be a really good one. Yeah. You get videos and fishing reports there. Oh, good. Good. And the videos are, are the videos more like flight time videos and or do you actually have stuff out on the water? No, they're all going to be like flight time videos primarily. Very little on the water. Yeah. And, uh, and our, our flight tank videos, you know, they're not they're not studio quality as many in the industry have really stepped that up, which is awesome. Um, but, uh, you know, I think our, our content has been uh, genuine and uh, proven about that. <laughs> well, the, and we'll t- hopefully talk about this if we have time. I know Jay Nicholas, I know, and he's been a big part of writing a lot of the videos over the years. Um, yeah, absolutely. And he's, awesome. and he's known as one of the, yeah, definitely one of the passionate, you know, one of the best out there as far as what he does. So this is, that's good. Um, okay. So, so that gives a, a little taste. And so basically it's since 96, uh, you've been going there and it sounds like you do a little bit of the, the guiding, a little bit of everything in the shop and you have staff. How many staff do you have there? We have about 10, um, right now. Um, and I mean, it sort of reminds. Yesterday was interesting. It reminds me of sort of my my start. We had a, a kid, uh, Owen, who's worked for us for the last uh, summer, spring, summer, and you know, he was going off to college. And I was like, I was kind of thinking like the Caddisflies always had like a history of of hiring young young kids. You know, I was one of them. You know, we will we'll like virtually break labor laws here in the 13, 14, 15 year old kids get them get them into the store. At, you know, they're passionate, they're, they want to learn, they'll, they'll do anything. You know, I remember, you know, being in a, you know, windowless storage room, pouring bulk cement into glass jars, uh, you know, mothballing giant bag, you know, 20 by 20 boxes of marabou. Uh, you know, <laughs> we'll do anything because, because we love it, you know, and trying, trying to, and you glean all the, the information that you can from the, from the guys that work there. Exactly. So, so you're still able to do that. Can you actually take a, a kid and, and get them in there, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> legally or whatever? Yeah, no, you can. Yeah. So I mean, Owen is old enough, but, uh, yeah, we do. And I, I think that's, uh, I, I like that about a fly shop. Always got to have that. You got to have those, that young energy around for sure. And how did that feel when you first, uh, in 96, when you, you know, you purchased actually officially purchased the shop? It was awesome. I mean, it was, uh, you know, in a, like maybe 10 years prior, you know, that was like a dream to be truthful. I mean, I, I was not, that wasn't really on my radar. I wasn't, I wasn't thinking that could ever happen. I mean, I had like a, I had a 1976 Dodge pickup, uh, to give to collateral to the SBA, uh, for my application. So it was uh, not, not really, uh, I mean, there wasn't really a lot, uh, of financial backing there. So yeah, it worked out good. And, you know, Bob made it, made it happen too. Um, which was good, good of him. So it's been fantastic. I mean, I've just been so lucky that the, you know, the river runs through it. Part of it was, was, uh, phenomenal. Was that about that time when, when you first bought it? It seemed like, it seemed like it was in there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, that was like when the store was going absolutely bonkers and, you know, you just had so many people getting into the sport. And then after, after that, you know, you, you kind of saw the internet come around and you know that's been that's been great as well so uh, i think i've been in a you know timing wise a great a great time in in the fly fishing business um and locally we are just super fortunate to have a a kind of a growing community the university of oregon around us two rivers that run right through town a tremendous amount of fishing in oregon as you know so it's it's a pretty idyllic situation well, I wanted to dig into, you know, there are a lot of things we could dig into. Obviously, there's steelhead fishing and there's a bunch of rivers, like you said, up there. I, I was kind of thinking the, you know, obviously the caddis fly shop, you've got the caddis all the day. The, the fall caddis, if we had to dig into a topic, is kind of interesting to me because, you know, caddis are an important species out there. Um, you know, if you take us, maybe take us to the river and think of that fall, you know, as you're preparing, say, for that October fishing 
Can you kind of just take us to the water? And I don't know, is the McKenzie, like, where would you be going? Would you be hitting the, in the fall? Would you be hitting the McKenzie or the Willamette? What would you be doing? Well, I like, I like both drainages, uh, uh, but in the upper reaches a little bit. I mean, de- depending on how cool that water in the lower end has gotten and how fast, you know, like later in the fall, the lower McKenzie and lower Willamette are going to fish well. But my personal favorite would be to get in kind of that upper reaches of the McKen- upper McKenzie, say, you know, from milepost 50 in that range, 10 miles up or 10 miles down on Highway 126. Or if you're going to talk the Middle Fork of the Willamette, we're going to be near the town of Oak Ridge. And, and both of those are fantastic fall caddis fisheries. But I have to I have to mention, and there's a, this is one of my, this has been probably the last 10 years or so, but prior to the October caddis, but still in the fall, is that short wing stonefly, which I think I first encountered um, in Idaho, uh, South Fork of the Boise, but has grown in importance in in my tactics locally. Uh, very interesting bug. Arlen Thompson discusses it in his book, Bug Water. You don't find a lot of other discussions about it though. It's a largely nocturnal stonefly that occurs in the fall. And it is, it is really good fishing. I mean, it's an underrated emergence of stoneflies uh, for, uh, in, in terms of when, when I talk to people about it, I don't, I don't hear a lot of people who really have it dialed in. So I'm going to be thinking like that in, in kind of early fall. And then, of course, as we get on and we start seeing October caddis, uh, you know, you can fish anything orange and, and have a shot for sure. And early fall is, w- w- for that, um, that stonefly, what, what is early fall? Is that like... Uh... First two weeks of September is is uh, is the beginnings, and on, on often it is well over with by October first. So it, it's it's earlier than the October caddis, and the October caddis can drag on into November for sure. We've had we've had mild falls or early winters where you can have great dry fly fishing well well down into the lower Mackenzie and Willamette on October caddis. That's right. So basically October cast and once you hit, it is October still. I mean, that, that hasn't changed. You can still. That hasn't changed. You can start, you can, you know, you can fish October cat as early as the first couple of weeks of September for sure. Um, but I typically I'm going to, I'm going to see that happening around the first of October and through mid November, assuming water conditions don't blow out, which I'm kind of, which I'm kind of hoping they do this year. Cause we need some water. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, well, let's just stay on the McKenzie since that's, you know, we have a few, a couple rivers we could fish, but if we talk about that McKenzie, that upper kind of the upper reaches. So talk about, you know, again, let's maybe go back on the river and are you guys doing the drift boats? Is that pretty much how you're fishing? Yeah, we do. Um, I actually ha- I have one of those outcast ambush rafts as well for, um, you know, for a single guy in super low water, but yes, drift boats are 99% of what we do. Uh, we have a guide service that that does the upper Mackenzie and a lot of the guys do that upper river. Um, and it's sort of technical boating, you know, lots of rocks to hit, lots of rocks to avoid. But all, that also means that there's a ton of pocket water, a ton of great, you know, all day fishing. Like you don't, you don't like sit down. You can be casting literally the entire day in that upper end. It's awesome. Uh, good, good wild fish, rainbows and cutthroats and uh, spectacular scenery. Um, so it's a great stretch of river. Okay. So, so basically that puts us there. So you're on the water and as you're going down, I guess it depends on the water levels, but you know, maybe just start us off with the flies first. If you're, if we're talking that caddis, I mean, are you guys kind of focusing on, you know, fishing a bigger bug there with the dropper? How, what's that look like your setup? Well, you can, uh, you can fish hopper dropper where, and, and we do a lot all spring and summer with a chubby Chernobyl and a, you know, like a Euro styled jigged nymph that's become kind of the favorite tactic but you know i've had some awesome days where uh you know we'll do like a foam bodied october caddis i think that's moorish foam october caddis or um a really big orange elk hair you know cut the nymphs off i mean i think it's the t- i think it's that time of year where you 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 got to just be a little more disciplined about your dry fly fishing and uh, talk yourself in into as a guide of just get rid of the nymph you know you don't need it anymore. Um, those fish are looking up. You have lower, lower sun angles. You have those overcast days. Even on the cool mornings um, late in October, I have often been very surprised 
at how good the dry fly fishing is, you know, when, even when it's really cold. And I, I think a lot of times you have those bugs struggling to move as well and the fish know it. And so the, I, I, I think get rid of the nymphs in October, fish, fish your dry flies. You can, you can move the bug around, you can dead drift it. Uh, you can, you can fish a big October caddis, but you also need to be looking at gray drakes, a parachute atoms is a great imitator for that. You can, you can have really nasty cold days and be looking at blue winged dollops as well. So it's, it's really awesome. Dry fly fishing, low water means the fish don't have to move a million miles. Uh, that short wing stone fly, which is a, a, it's not a good flyer has pushed fish to the edges because they're looking for those bugs on the edges. Uh, October caddis, the same that, you know, you've got fish that have moved over to the edge of the river. So you, you don't, you don't have any trouble finding fish on October caddis adults in very shallow water near the shore. You've got salmon spawning, uh, first few weeks of, uh, that, that kind of third week of September that's in full swing. So again, trial move over to the edges. And, uh, I just think it's a great time to be fishing dry flies, uh, large mid to large size, October caddis. It's a great time of year. There you go. So, yeah. And that's, uh, those are some good tips. Basically. Yeah. The, the edges is, I mean, when you're floating down, is that typically when you're in the drift boat? Uh, I mean, there's probably areas where you find structure, but is that like 80% of the time you're fishing, you're drifting in the middle of the river and casting towards the bank? Well, I would say that's actually where the, yes, I, I wouldn't say that we don't do that, but I would say that's where the Mackenzie kind of differs from some of the, uh, Rocky streams. You know, we're not, we're not 100% directed at that. Um, the Mackenzie is really a salmon, a Chinook salmon river is how I think about it. It's historically the, the salmon were, and I hope continue to be kind of the key ingredient to that river's success. So those spring Chinooks come up in May and June and July. They sit down in the deepest, coldest pools of that upper river. And you know, those big trout do the same thing, right? So when they're in the midsummer, when they've got splash and giggle traffic over them all summer in a pretty, in pretty low water, I'm really convinced that those fish move to that deep green water and that's where they settle. Now, do, you, do they go out on the edges in the fall? Yes. But the, some of those fish still hang in that deep green water. They'll still come up. But there's no doubt you want to concentrate on fishing, you know, mid mid river around giant boulders or some just gorgeous, you know, sort of volcanic structure up there in mid river mid river that I'm I'm definitely going to fish it to fish to. Okay, so so basically you're you're open to fish. You're not just focused on the bank. There's going to be some areas, especially you're really not. You're really not. Yeah, I mean, I think that sometimes when that short wing stonefly hatch happens, that's you know you're you know, you're going to need to do that. But I but as you move into October caddis time, you, you need to be looking everywhere. Okay, and and that's that short wing stonefly. So you mentioned the bug water book. I'll put a um, a link in the show notes to that book so we can dig into that. But that's. Yeah, I think I've seen those as well. I mean, those are, they're basically don't have, it's almost, they don't have a wing, right? I mean, it's just super tiny. They, they can't fly or anything, right? I think it's the male that can't fly at all. Um, and that book, by the way, you know, I mean, I grew up with Western hatches, just, you know, like referencing it constantly, Dave Hughes and Rick Halfley, it was just an awesome book. But to me, that's the modern Western hatches. Uh, and he does such a great job of explaining it in, you know, non entomologist terms. Um, I can't, I, I can't recommend that book anymore. I mean, it's just so, it's so good. I'm excited for that book. That's great. Yeah. Because Western hatches is kind of like one of the, you know, one of the big, yeah, exactly. It is kind of the Bible, but there's actually, this one's actually newer. So this, this has come out since then. Yes. Oh, much. More. Yeah, no, no. And Arlen, Arlen had like fish tanks in his front yard. He was running water through for bugs. And <laughs> I mean, he did, he, he's, he's a, really worked at it. It's tremendous. Is he like local down there or? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nice. That's perfect. Okay. Well, that's like, that's a killer resource. So, and I think, I'm not sure we may have joked about, you know, when we're on the river, like, I, I think maybe it's a hermaph hermaphrodite. I'm not sure if that, if that's what that, that short wing stonefly is, but the, I remember I was talking to somebody, I think uh, one of my buddies, Shannon was mentioning that, that, you know, cause we'd see them on the Deschutes as well. Right. Crawling cool. around at, at night. Yeah. So yeah. Just like you said, you'd see them at night and they'd pop out and they, wow, these things, what's the deal with these, these stone fly and they're good size, right? They're pretty, they're, they're not like, they really are. Yeah. They're, they're like a golden, you know, like a Deschutes golden stone size. Yeah. Cool. So, so, and is it Arlen? Arlen, A-R-L-E-N. Thomason. Thomason. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'll definitely. Uh, that'll be awesome to get a little background on that. So, 
Well, it sounds like we're getting a little feel for it. So you're floating down and you guys do what you do a lot of day trips. Is that kind of the typical guide trip you do up there in the fall? Yeah, we do. You know, we don't do any overnight stuff. And that is one thing about the fall. It's fantastic is that kind of midday is the best. You know, you can you can start earlier, but your best fishing can often be between 10 and 4. And when you lose that sun uh, completely and that cools down, it can shut down pretty quickly, especially late in October um, on the on the upper river. You've got a little bit of elevation and you lose all your heat. And, you know, I, I think those fish definitely feed midday more than any time. In, and I'm talking later, later October, mid to late October when I say that. Mid to late October. Yeah. yeah. So if you're out there in late September, you could, st- it could still be a hundred degrees, right? Like depending, or maybe not a hundred. Yeah. But it, it, it's, and I think, I think again, you lose some traffic and you lose a little bit of that light, uh, right overhead and you've got the salmon going. So those fish, those fish tune in pretty early in September. So again, we're going back to that. So you mentioned the Moorish. I think he has, he must have a foam like an October caddis, but there's some flies, but you're saying, don't be afraid to just cut off your hopper dropper and just go straight with the standard caddis. How do you know when, when to go with that caddis? I mean, are you seeing them just when you see them around, is that time to switch to just the caddis? Yeah, I think, I think you're seeing, you're seeing some caddis. The, the upper river has a, a more metolius river like bottom structure and insect population. So we have a variety of mid-sized rust colored caddis throughout the year. And then it, and, and, and that will, those will still be going on in the fall. And then, so I don't, I don't, I don't think that it's just that prevalence of the, of the October caddis that, that makes these fish go up. I think it's a, it's a variety of conditions as well as insects. Cause a lot of times the October caddis, it's not like you get to view fish smashing these things as they're dead drifting down, you know, on the, on the bank. It's just that they, they're they rarely available to fish much of the year, but they do, when they do oviposit or lay their eggs, they're, they're really dapping and really active. And that, that just turns those fish's heads up to look at anything. And so I think once that begins in, in you can start fishing a, a lot more dry flies. Okay. And that typically begins sometime in October. You don't know exactly when, but is there a rough time for you? said somebody was planning a trip, you know, with you for a day up there, you know, right now, would you say, you know, mid October, you just don't know? Well, I'd say anytime after October 1st, I mean, mid October, you're in it for sure. Yeah, you are, you are, but you know, you, you also say that, Hey, it could be a pretty nasty day in mid October. Uh, that hasn't been the case for the last 10 years, but I'm still, I'm still arguing back <laughs> to when we actually had falls and winters, but, um, it, it could start, it could start, uh, it could start in the first week of October for sure. And, and let's go to the fly box a little bit, because you've mentioned a few, you mentioned this stone fly. We were talking about the October caddis or some other smaller caddis. What, what's your box look like when you're getting ready for that October or somebody was planning now for that October trip? What should their box, you know, and, and we could talk nymphs, right? Do you also have some uh, caddis nymphs that you use as well? I, I got to be honest. I'm not, I'm not a big October caddis nymph, you know, to really imitate that bug. I, I haven't cracked that code or I haven't tried too hard. We sell a ton of those nymphs. Um, I thought that mostly it seems like they're for steelhead on the rogue, but um, I, I, I don't tackle that as much. Although I will say that, you know, one of our number one nymphs, and I, I'm sure this does a reasonable job of it, is like a, an oversized posse bugger, which has become kind of a favorite fly for guides and anglers locally for many, many years. And it was a, it was a fly that Dave Hall created of Umqua when he was there when they had an excess of possum skins from uh, New Zealand or Australia, I forget where. And um, he, so it's like a possum body, but, but I think the key to that fly and, and to many October caddis nymphs is just that, that black collar, that sort of that, that real contrast between the black head and the rest of the fly. So that's what I'm looking for in a nymph. And there are many specific October caddis um, nymphs, Anderson's, and I think Morris has some and, uh, some are just called a tungsten October caddis I, I know, and rainy's got a stick caddis. And I think, I think many of them just need that contrast between head and body, whether it be uh, black to orange or black to tan. Uh, and, and they're oversized, of course, they're pretty big. So 
that's I think that's something that you would do earlier. So that's something I'm going to do in September more than I am going to be in October. Uh, you know, the one thing interesting about that hatch, and I, I, I'm Arlen could do more for it here, but it seems like those bugs come out and then they're around for a really long time sometimes. You know, the, the October cat is adult. So that that nymph is, you know, on an annual cycle, right? It's going to come out, it's going to be active and, you know, maybe late or well, mid September, all the way to emergence, let's say October 1st. And these are just rough dates, of course, but so that that's kind of your, your nymph period. And then that, that adult comes out. And then as we talked about it, it's, it's not always active on the surface, but it's available for a really long period of time to those fish. It, it's often very, very late in the year when there are just like so many October caddis out on the surface, you're like, where do I start? But that, those are rare days where, where you really see a ton of those bugs on on the surface or, or all laying eggs at once. So I think that's, I think that's kind of the cycle is to kind of look to nymph with a larger October caddis nymph, uh, mid September on, and then, and then move to the dry flies, October one on. And if I'm going to nymph, uh, that's not one that I'll probably do as a hopper dropper, just cause those nymphs tend to be kind of eights. And, you know, I need, I need to dedicate myself to getting that fly down either in maybe using that October caddis as a bottom fly on a two fly nymph frig, uh, where the upper, uh, you know, the up, up bottom fly is the October caddis and up above that, I've got a smaller pheasant tail or, you know, sort of blue winged olive type imitation or gray drake nymph imitation, which is just be a, a general mayfly nymph in like a 14, 12, 14, something like that. So that, that's how I would approach the, the the nymphing strategy to the October caddis. I'd do it earlier in the season than the adult, and I would dedicate myself to the bottom. And once I get to fall, if I'm going to use that October caddis as a hopper dropper, I'm probably going to go away from an October caddis nymph as my dropper just because it's so heavy. It's going to sink any dry fly virtually, even a chubby. I suppose a chubby would hold it up reasonably well, but I just don't think you need to. You can go to a, a more slender um euro jig type nymph uh which just seems to murder them all the time anyway i mean i mean i just like that i like the style of the fly i'm not a huge i mean I, I obviously i teach it and i know how to do it and all that but but i just like the way those flies sink and that's critical in the upper mackenzie or upper willamette is that you know like drift boats flying down the river how quickly can that nymph get in the bucket underneath the big dry fly so those flies are just absolutely perfect for us. Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. Togan's Fly Shop, providing superior quality products at an affordable price, an amazing resource for fly tying materials, tools, and fly fishing accessories. Togan's has you covered when looking for unique in-house products, but also supports and supplies materials and tools from other leading fly brands you know and trust. Togans is now offering their mystery fly tying box where they simplify the process for you in choosing materials. You're only one click away from these hand picked subscription tying boxes that are packed with value at almost half the cost. And I recently made a order through Togans and the experience was perfect. After a uh, recent trip uh, nipping for trout, I had to replace my tungsten beads and some jig hooks and a few other items. The products arrived in a couple of days from Togans with a nice little card, a bonus value, and a welcome note from the Togans family. Since 2005, Togans has been over delivering on price and customer service, so it's time to discover for yourself what the buzz is all about. Head over to wetflyswing.com slash Togans and take a look at their diverse selection of products today. You can support this podcast by clicking over to take a look at Togans online. That's wetflyswing.com slash T O G E N S tokens. Okay. Now back to the show. Yeah. So you're not necessarily, well, like you said, I mean, you've got the tungsten beat on there. So that thing that's, that's key for you getting, getting your nymphs down and, and where you guys are fishing. Yeah. The, the tungsten beat and now these, uh, what are these new things? Umqua calls them jig bombs. Hairline calls them, uh, Oh, come on. Uh, there's something like that, but you know, it's a little bit different than a traditional bead. Yeah. So they're, they're really, they sink even faster. Nice. Nice. I'll put a link out to that as well in the show notes. So, 
So this this has given us a good. Now we talked a little about nymphs. Maybe well, maybe just before we leave this nymph conversation, describe again that leader setup. So how how does that look if you are fishing the big October with a small BWO or something else? How are you doing your leader? Well, um, I per- personally I've gone. I've I, I hate to talk about this as a retailer. Can I take no comment? No, yeah. I'm, I'm, kind of, I, I'm kind of building my own leaders on on uh, that program. I'm I'm building a really short, stiff section. This is really designed for the for the local scene, but I'm sure it works everywhere. I'm going to either cut off a nine foot leader back, you know, cut sixty percent of it off, or I'm going to take two chunks of Maxima. Uh, 25 and 15, tie them together in a short section, tie a tippet ring on that so that I can go from 15 pound maxima to like 4X. So it's that criti- that's the critical junction. Above the tippet ring, I'm going to tie a dropper line where my dry fly sits. And then below that, at whatever depth you want, I'm going to have my Euro jig. Whatever. I mean, I'm talking. I'm talking hopper dropper leader here. If I'm going, if I'm going, I can I can discuss the nymph leader too if you want. But that it's it's not going to be that much different, right? Because um, the key the key is whatever you're using as your indicator. Below that, whether it be a dry fly or whether it be an indicator, the key is that transition between indicator and fly being as thin as it can possibly be to to relate to the euro style fishing right i'm not i'm not euro style fishing with this rig because i off because i'm often doing it out of a drift boat or i just don't want to do that but i'm trying to get the sink rate to be max by using the smallest tippet within reason off that tippet ring closest to my indicator so basically you're doing some like floral carbon for your tippet yeah, I mean, I, I don't. I mean, that doesn't matter that much. These flies have gotten so heavy. If you're not into fluorocarbon, then I don't. You know, this is not a big deal. Yep, just whatever. Just use four X. Use four yeah. X and a tippet ring. Right. I mean, you, you know, years of old. I mean, very simply, we cut a nine foot four X leader in half, blood knotted it together. That became the stopper, right? And now the dry flies above that stopper, and the nymphs at the end of the nine foot four X leader. Okay, that's that's one way for someone to do it in, in that's that likes tapered leaders. The, the 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 downside of that tapered leader is from your dry fly now that you've used it above that stopper where you retied it together, you now have what 20 pound test. So you're trying to sink 20 pound test along with your jig nymph. I'm not saying it doesn't work. It did work. Because somehow we caught fish for years. Um, but, but, you know, you can do it better. That's the point, but you cannot tie, you know, 20 pound, whatever to four X with a conventional, knot very well. Hence the tippet ring, uh, transition. That's why the tippet ring is so huge is that it allows you to, to do that. And, and, and you're basically, you said four X. So, so how long is your tip from that tippet ring down to your, your, your fly or nip, your nip from the end? Yeah, and I think that's an interesting. That's a good question, and and um, it's it's often, but only about four feet. Uh, but it can be longer, uh, depending on the run. And to be truthful, I don't mess with it a whole lot. I kind of fish it till I go. Uh, it seems a little too short. But in the fall, it almost never gets too short. And then I ask myself, why aren't you just tying it off the bend of the hook? And then I say, wait, casting that sucks. The the system that I just discussed is way better because you're only casting that nymph and the dry fly simply along for the ride. So the I, I think I think that's the key to that. And I think to our discussion about the fall, shorter is fine. You know, four feet might be too long some days. Uh, don't don't need it. What what's happening in terms of developmental stages of insects in the late fall? It's winding down. We're seeing everybody that that has emerged emerge or can, you know we're at the tail end of it blue winged olives gray drakes october caddis what's really going to emerge in december midges not important on the mackenzie so i think you can you can kind of say hey that bottom range of the of the river um you don't need to roll stonefly nymphs i guess is my point i'm not saying it won't work but i think you can kind of elevate your whole system whether it be just fishing a dry fly or when you do that hopper dropper you know shorten your drop 
And one final thing on that. So on that, what you describe with the leader, so you have the tippet ring. And then if you are doing a hopper dropper, the hopper is above that tippet ring. And how is it tied on to the, to the leader? What, what sort of knot are you using to get the, the dry fly on there? Well, I've done, I've experimented with both tying direct into the, the ring, which I don't like, or what I do is I tie a double surgeons or, um, perfection loop on a five inch piece of monofilament. It's not on anything. And then I overhand it over the top of the main line that leads into the overhand that leads into the tippet ring. So it can slide because it's just a overhand loop, you know, but it doesn't because it's tight and it's jammed up against that tippet ring. Okay. And then, and then, like you said, if you're doing a nip, if you're just take off the, the dry, you basically, you just take off the dry and fish that same setup as a nymph. Yeah. You could screw on one of those airlock things and, um, extend your leader and you're there. Okay. Well, that gives us a little rundown there for both nymphs and dries. And yeah, I, I guess, um, you know, anything else to shed any other big, uh, I mean, you've mentioned a number of different hatches, but I guess if we're thinking that early stone, you get some October caddis and then you get obviously all the other caddis, right? Different sizes, the normal size 12s and 14s that are flying around like crazy. Are you still getting, are you getting big caddis hatches of those out there? Uh, I mean, I don't know that I'd call them big, but they're substantial enough to get fish going. Uh, you know, as early as September, I'm fishing, uh, I mean, a size 14 like uh swishers dancing caddis is a favorite uh i just i like that parachute really you know sort of almost overdressed smaller caddis that floats regardless you know i really i really think that i on the mckenzie and we, we've even created flies as a kind of our shop overdressed we call them heavy hackle parachute atoms or heavy hackle this and um that that is uh, kind of a guide thing where you just don't want to mess with your fly. You just want it to float. So uh, that's my, that's kind of my strategy on smaller caddis too. Give me something that's got a good deer hair wing, a good parachute hackle, and is highly visible even in the 14, 16 range. Um, and those are, those are great patterns to, to be fishing all through the, the setup. I mean, if I've got somebody that's struggling to cast a really big fly and, or I've got a fish that, you know, just as being a bit picky and I need to fish a smaller, longer leader, I'll, I'll put on a smaller caddis all through uh, September, October and do well too. And even earlier, you know, I mean, this season, I, I, with low water and warmer water earlier and that, I just kind of convinced myself that I needed to fish smaller flies more and, and dry flies. And I, that's what I did. I just, I fished a lot of parachute atoms and parachute caddis and, uh, they work great. And as you go into, so we were, you know, we're talking October, November, at what point do you, I mean, does the fishing really slow down? I guess it slows down for dries, but are you guys fishing through the whole winter out there? We're really lucky in that regard. Uh, as I said, the lower Mackenzie, once those water temperature drops and assuming not a water blowout, we have fishing like right close to town all the way through November. If it's, if it's stable. Yeah. The key, the key is stability. I mean, the fish are there and they're not going to get washed around too much. Then the fishing is going to hold up all winter. But if you get a big like November flood event, that changes it up. It really does. Yeah. So that's it. So if you have a, a low, like this year, if you have a low stable, you know, like it's been, you know, not a lot of rain, pretty, you know, hot. And then it, it cools down slowly. You could be fishing all the way in front of right in town all the way through November, December sort of thing. Absolutely. I would say that upper section that we talked about, though, then you're dealing with water temperatures. And once those water temperatures really, yeah, once they really get cold, that's over for me around Halloween. I, I just, I struggle to, I struggle to get those fish to move a lot beyond, beyond about Halloween now, but the lower reach is really good. And also there's a, the lower reaches, there's the Eugene, but there's also, I mean, all the way down into say fishing towards like the lower McKenzie, right? Towards like where it goes under I-5. Is that still, a, is that a decent section to be thinking about too? And that's a great section. I mean, it's, it's, it's so underrated. Putting in an Armitage Park puts you in the McKenzie. You're about a mile and a half from the confluence of the Willamette. And then you're so, so once you're through the McKenzie, you're now on the Willamette, uh, proper main stem and now you're going to float down through just tons of gravel bars uh and 
and drop offs and banks and and there's a lot of there's a lot and of course it's super easy to boat so anything I mean a paddle board included virtually um, is is safe so beginning boaters great section you can take out on the river roadside um, at a Hayes Lane or you can take out on the Coburg side which I prefer to at a place called Christensen Landing and that, that's a, that's a great section of water. So yeah, there's tons of, so even through into December and then at some point, you know, I mean, I guess then you get into transition to really like blue winged doves in wintertime where it can get cold, but even then you might have mild winters, right? Through all the way through January, February. Yeah. I mean, I'd say that, I'd say anglers need to look at those blue winged olives though in October. Um, and, and, and especially on the upper river too, like that's those, that's sort of your nasty day, cold, um, bug and like we're, we're out there cast, 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 can't find them, can't find them, can't get them to eat, but there's fish rising all around me. Well, you know, you look really closely and there's that size 20 sort of iron colored blue winged olive that you could barely see. Um, that happens in October, November for sure. Uh, I, I don't think it, not a lot happens after that. I mean, you, you don't have too many hatches. I mean, we're going to start looking at blue winged olives again in February after, after December. No, that's good. That gives us a little taste of not only that upper river, but kind of the lower. I, I want to touch on before we kind of wrap it up with some of the fishing. Um, I mentioned Jay Nicholas and he was on way back. Uh, he was actually one of our first guests back in episode. Um, I think it was number three, right? We're at, we're at 247 now wow. uh, on cool. this one. So we've been going since, uh, you know, 2017 and, and Jay's awesome. I know Jay and he, uh, right. He's been a big part. How, how did you meet Jay? Gosh, um, I, I just met him at the shop, I think. I mean, uh, I think him and Matt Stansbury, who I mentioned earlier, uh, the blog, um, you know, may have met through either like native fish. I mean, I, I honestly, I don't have, I can't peg it down precisely. He was just there. You, I mean, you, he like it, he's ingrained into the caddis fly shop. He is. And then like, I mean, he and I went out fishing and kind of talked about what, uh, he could do for me and, and I could do for him. And, and, uh, we've, we've been friends and colleagues ever since. And he, you know, not only has contributed to the blog, but it contributed to our website a lot. And, um, you know, has, has been great through, throughout since, you know, I can't remember exactly when it was, but let's say, you know, mid 2000 or 10, 10, you know, after, 2012 on, I suppose. Yeah, maybe maybe earlier than that. So he's been going strong doing videos, right? That that whole time. Yeah, and he's you know also I think like um, he's been integral in some of those uh, sort of fisheries that we wish we had better conditions to attack. You know, his fishing out of Pacific City for you know rock bass and salmon and and stuff and on the fly, uh, you know, opened people's eyes to some fisheries that maybe they didn't think of as often as they could have. Um, and that, that he was, he was a great contributor to that as well. That's right. So he, and, and then, so you have Jay and then are there other, I mean, a number of other people that are contributing uh, the, the videos, the tying videos? Well, lately we've, um, we, yeah, we've had some, uh, Justin Helm who works in the shop. Uh, I've had, uh, Alex Worth who, uh, it was, you know, like customer flight tire, kids tennis coach, um, Jim Sens, who's a dedicated angler and fly tire. Uh, he also ties some flies for the shop that we sell. Uh, Tony Torrance, who uh, has kind of a, a similar history to the caddis fly that I do, although never really worked there a whole lot, but I've um, always been a um, contributor and advocate for the shop. So to, yeah, we've had some, we've had, you know, you, that's why I always say about Eugene too, is that, you know, historically speaking, like we've just had a lot of great, um, fly tires, fishers in the community, uh, in, in our, in our kind of Western Oregon, we've just been lucky that way, you know, to, to have those guys. Uh, I was thinking, you know, and this is recently, I, I'm not sure when this came out because you guys, I post, I guess, Jay, right, you guys write different blog posts. Is, it, is there a, a mixture of people that write blog? Because you have the YouTube videos, but you also have the blog. Is that just kind of you and whoever or who's doing that mostly? Yeah, I mean, I'm... I'm You're the main. I see your name out there a lot on a lot of them. I, I, wish, I wish that I had some more contributions. It's a lot hard. I'm sure many people who uh, do blogs or, uh, and, or look for content understand how difficult it is to keep something like this going since 2008. It's rough. Um, but anyway, yes, I am doing all that now. Um, I love it when I get contributions from Jay and Matt and 
others. And, you know, I'm trying to get em uh, employees involved and trying to get them to do videos and um, keep it fresh. But uh, it, it's it's can be challenging. And uh, but I I've been lucky to have all those guys do it. And, and uh, you know, I got I got to stay on it. I know that, that is it. Yeah. I mean, there's people there's companies out there online that have whole teams of people and ambassadors, you know, that are writing and keeping the con. I mean, it's crazy, right? To think like Google, I, you know, you can look at the numbers, but it's so crazy to think how competitive it is to get on, even on first page anymore for stuff. That's one thing that I, uh, I it was funny. I had that whole, uh, the, the J article about fly names, right? That was a, that, that this, this, this sort of solidified my whole position on the internet for Fortunately, I think I've kind of felt this way forever, but like, um, I remember kind of stressing about all the, the sort of hate discussion that happened after that. And I was like, then I just kind of came to this realization that, you know, if you're genuine in what you put out there, regardless of what it is, okay, is a conservation, a fishing post, a fishing discussion, a fly tank video, you know, it may not be the greatest quality, but if you're genuine, you're in, in your intent. I don't really want to, I don't want to discuss what you think of it beyond that. And if I don't want to, it, I don't have to, it's my, it's my blog, my content, you know, I mean, like it's not for, it's, uh, I, I'm not working for the national news. Um, so the, that, that's, and also the whole, the whole ranking system about Google and all that, you, you can't worry yourself as much about that. If what you're putting out is intentionally productive to the, to the angling community or any community, um, you know, don't worry about it after that. And, and I haven't, I mean, I honestly, I cannot grind those numbers out. I, I don't have any desire to do it, um, about analytics. Um, I, I hope it's going okay. It seems to be my, my results speak in my, in <laughs> my business and lifestyle. So I'm, I'm not going to worry about it. Exactly. No, I agree. I think, yeah, you look at the, you know, your key performance indicators or whatever, you know, I mean, if it's, if it's making money, you have a business. I mean, if you're growing the business, then who really cares about what the analytics of Google look like? I mean, it's. Like, and as you said, it, there's a lot of people that'll take your money um, to try to help you. And I'm not saying that they won't, um, but look at the, look at the long run too. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. You just, you, you know, you put something out there that's valuable. That's the bottom line. And yeah, that's it's right. interesting. You mentioned the, uh, the J article because I know Kelly Gallup has been on um, the podcast a couple of times and I know him just through the podcast and he's, you know, we've had great conversation. That was really interesting because I remember when I, somebody mentioned that, I think I might've posted about Kelly Gallup and somebody said, Hey, you should check out this, the Oregon fishing blog about <laughs> Jay's article. And I was like, Oh, and I, and I checked it out and I was like, well, <clears throat> It was kind of tough because I know both Jay and, and I was kind of thinking like the, the, and I've asked a couple of guests since then what, what their take was on the naming and stuff. But I mean, what's your, what's your take on, I mean, I guess Jay, he had his take about it and there's other people, I mean, not to, and I only bring this up because I think it does provide some clarity for people that are into maybe tying flies and what all this, this history is about. But, you know, do you have a take either way, as far as the naming, it seems like, um, you know, what do you think of, or maybe just talk generally about that article? Cause I know that kind of went viral, right? <laughs> yeah, that was, it was wild. Um, but no, you know, my, my take is in terms of the overall is just, can we do better on the naming? And, and to me, the answer is yes. So I don't, I don't have a, a take on who, why, here, how, what, whatever. I just, just, you know, can we, can we do a better job of being thoughtful in our content? And in produce whatever we're doing artistically or otherwise, and you know that I think I think that's the gist of the article. Um, I, I so the 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 part that was weird as the blog manager, and the part that nobody got to see so much was you know the the kind of troll type comments, and I I think it's just sort of a societal issue at the moment. Um, maybe it's always been there. But I, I think that was a, that was a really interesting kind of learning experience for me. Like I said, you know, I just, you know, I just you have to just kind of block that stuff out and say, you know, how much of this is really um, for real? <laughs> you know, how much of this sort of hate speech is for real? And I don't I really honestly don't think I think there are some people who are looking to sort of engage and I did not engage. And so I, I feel like um, that's the right way to play it. I agree. I, I think that, um, 
Yeah, I think there was some comments out there from whoever that were like, yeah, you're, you're, you know, monitoring, you're not, you're letting only the comments you go through. But I agree. It's like, I mean, you know, Jay wrote this article um, and, you know, if there are trolls out there, which there are, you know, there are people that are trying to do this, trying to stir up stuff, then why would you want that to be? That's not helping anything. I think, and the point you said about moving on is what I think everybody agrees on the Kelly, you know, the Kelly Gallup thing. It's like, you know, that was a time ago, right? That was back whenever he created those. And it was a different time. You know, exactly. the comedians, I've, I've had the, the, some comedians talk about this. I've heard some famous comedians say, you know, it's like Eddie Murphy, right? You go back in the 80s. There's nobody doing Eddie Murphy comedy or what, <laughs> you know what I mean? Cool. Like, it's just not happening. But then it was, oh, it was people did it. And, and that's the same thing with these naming things. Like Kelly isn't naming his flies, whatever porn name anymore. You know, I mean, it's not the same. We're not in the same, you know, deal. So anyways, I appreciate you talking about moving on because I think that's a great take on the whole thing. Yeah, I, I think that's how we, we've all got to learn to do better every day. That's that's it. You know, that's that was the message. Yeah. And, and did that did that article, I mean, when you look at, I guess maybe you maybe didn't even look at the analytics, but I mean, did you just see just by the comments, the sheer comments, how much more viral it went compared to other posts? Oh, yeah. I mean, it wasn't close. Absolutely. You know, and, that, and that's where I reached out um, to someone in sort of the business of, you know, as, as a business, are you worried about what the um possible um you know results of you putting this kind of content out there do you want to mitigate that or do you want to just kind of live with it and go with it you know and, and you can break that down further to say are you worried about losing customers over this uh or not right i mean that, that's the and and do you want to do something or say something that would uh you know stop or, or sort of try to mitigate what some of these people are saying and you know, that's a tough one. That's a tough call for any business. You know, I know some businesses this fall are going through this, you know, do I wear a mask or not? Or do I have my customers wear a mask or not? You know, it's kind of the same thing. Like if, if businesses want to take a stand, you know, I just, I just applaud those who are willing to take your stand. Okay. Just whatever, whatever you believe in, go for it. You know, you can have these people tell you that you're never going to shop with you. They're never going to, I hope you got a business in six months on and on and on. Uh, you know, that, you got to just stick to your guns. Don't, you know, and, you know, and I think again, just being your genuine in your, uh, in what you believe is, is gonna, is gonna hold up. Just to wrap that up. I mean, you could look at a, a number of different examples, the Orvis stuff with that 50, 50 movement when that started, you know, it was a similar deal. They got tons of hate mail and, and, and like all sorts of weird stuff. And you're like, wow. I mean, people are against, uh, you know, women, <laughs> women in fly fishing. It's like, wow, these are the people. So I just look at it like for you, for a business owner and you know that, I mean, those definitely aren't the customers you want anyways. Right. So it's not like you're losing anybody who's, you know what I mean? Somebody well, yeah, does that's what, that's what I want all businesses to understand is that those people probably weren't your customers anyway. Those true, those really hateful comments are, those are, those are people that are doing that to stir the pot. That's it. Yeah, I think I think you handled it well, and I, and I love it because you know that, that article went out there. You had no idea what sort of how it was going to resonate, but you you know you published it, you know, and people came back and got crazy. But it, it got people talking, you know. I mean, so so that's a good thing. Um, yeah, I think so. Okay, um, yeah, I just want to wrap this up. So we um, I have a little segment called the two twenty two top tips, uh, flies and resources, and we've we've nailed uh, a number of these things. But maybe we can just. Start off with uh, top flies again. Let's take it back to like mid October. So if you have to pick two flies, and you may have mentioned them, but what what are those two that you have to fish with in your box? Well, I want to have a Moorish foam October caddis as my dry fly. If I if I have to uh, pick another dry, it's going to be just a heavy hackle parachute atoms. That's going to be a winner throughout. Uh, uh, if I'm going to go subsurface, it's going to be a nymph, uh, a modern nymph, uh, with like a year, a jig. And there's a lot of great ones out these days. We'll go with one of our local ones, which is called jigged posse bugger. And that's a great all around nymph for everything, uh, on the Mackenzie all year long, but it's going to, it's going to continue to work through the fall. And are you guys ever even thinking about, um, uh, wet flies at all or any of that store stuff? Is it more just dry surface or down below? Well, we we're, we talked about a section of river that kind of dictated some of that discussion, how, uh, and that being the Upper Mackenzie. So, if I'm, yeah, I mean, I can't tell you how much great swing water we have on the Mackenzie and Willamette in the lower reaches. It's so killer. So, yes, uh, I love a, a, a orange soft tackle in the fall. 
love a dark and let's go back let's go back to the just the original old school wet flies let's go to a, a dark cahill wet i mean great fly uh, I loved uh, a sort of a, a thread body wire ribbed partridge hackle, like Sylvester Neem style uh, soft hackle. With it can be a gray, it can be yellow, it could be orange body. Swinging that in the lower Mackenzie is so good. You know, I mean, you know, you just got to avoid the leaves in the late fall, and you're catching fish. And there's a tremendous cutthroat population in that lower river, and they absolutely crush wet flies. And, and I'll, I'll even, you know, we did that discussion about the leader. I'll even use that leader. I'll use that same leader. And on my upper fly, upper wet fly will be like an oversized um, orange soft tackle. And, and then down below it, I'll have something a little bit smaller. And you can incorporate a, you can incorporate like a brass bead or something that's not just crazy heavy in that upper fly. That's going to slow the swing. But oh man, we have some great swing water in the Lower Mackenzie. It's just not. It's just not in that upper river where it's just steaming downhill because of the elevational drop. You need to get down below the dam, and ideally, or even lower. Let's you know from Hendricks Park all the way to the confluence of the Willamette. If we're talking Mackenzie, and then beyond, that is this primo swing water. Uh, and and honestly, from a biological standpoint, in terms of spawning habitat and holding some of the overall largest fish in the Mackenzie Basin, Hendricks Bridge to the Confluence is is it. Definitely. Okay. And and are you guys using uh, like Koffler drift boats? What's your drift boat of choice? We are using Koffler drift boats. I think almost everybody uh, in our in our staff is uh That's right. You kind of have to. They're they're right next door. They're they're uh, <laughs> well Joe does a great job. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. he's got a great boat Joe's and awesome. he kind of knows our um our what how we do it. Yeah. Are you doing the 16, uh, like by the, the smaller boat or the, what are you doing for their size? Mine is 16, 6, 52. So I think it's a boat that, uh, Ken Helfrich designed for the middle fork of the salmon. And, uh, yeah. And it's, it is just ideal for the upper river and dodging rocks side to side, sort of like that middle fork of the salmon in a similar way. And so we don't, you know, I'm not running a 54 wide boat anymore. I did growing up. Uh, and even before that, I just had a 1648, you know, just the classic Mackenzie style drift boat, but these a little bit longer boats kind of are, are great, uh, to just both distribute weight and get quick side to side. That's awesome. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned, uh, Helfridge. I was talking to him. We, we did a little mini series, mini podcast series on the drift boats. And we had, uh, I think we got about 15 episodes on the whole history and, um, even got into some of the Grand Canyon, those dories. It was really, really cool. So I'm hoping to get Helfridge, um, him on as well to, to keep that story going. So, um, okay, well, let's uh, and let's take us to back to the 222. So now we're up to um, some tips. So two tips. So if we're in the drift boat, we're floating down river, we're with you, you know, we got the flies, say it's mid-October somewhere in there. What, what sort of tip would you give me or somebody out there fishing to help them get into a fish? Uh, well, if you're, in the, if you're in the front of the drift boat, I want you looking ahead all the time and i want you casting downstream at least uh, at least down from my oar lock uh if we're headed down and you're fishing the right bank i want you downstream enough so that we're working together i don't want you casting behind the boat because now we're dragging the flies downstream so that's number one um the other is out of a drift boat is i don't need too much fly line on the water so the more fly line you have between you and your flies and the uh and conceivably the bucket the, that you've cast into the more drag that we're going to have that's going to pull those flies out of there. So I need a high rod tip and line management, both from, I mean, entirely from the, from the hand to the fly, meaning less line on the water when you make a mend, uh, sometimes just holding that line up off the water, uh, not, not trying to get uh, that kind of, you think of a slower moving flat water situation where you're trying to get that perfect drag free drift, you're just ripping the line off the reel. I'm going to stay shorter and less line on the water for you to get an effective drift. And so I, yeah, I want to kind of keep that fly going as slow as possible. And are you just using typically if somebody rod wise, just nine foot five weight or is there another setup to use there? Yeah. A nine foot five weight is fine. Yeah. A little longer rod. Uh, sometimes guys that prefer that it's, it's pretty deadly kind of what I just, my discussion just this there about keeping line off the water and keeping that drift, uh, that, that long rod is pretty sweet. Okay. 
So that gives us a little firepower there. And then just on resource, you mentioned probably the best one, the um, uh, the bug water. Is there another resource or somewhere where you direct me? It could be a book, magazine, a video, anything where somebody could dig in more into that fall fishing or even focused on the caddis. Well, I'd say Oregon fly fishing blog and October caddis. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, Arlen is a good one. I mean, anything Dave Hughes has ever written about caddis flies is good because Dave knows our area, fishes in our area. Um, so... Uh, you know, that's good. I know that he may not be as, uh, you know, recent as everything he's written about October Caddis is fantastic. Um, you know, and I, and I don't want to discount Randall Kaufman and his, his, uh, orange stimulator. It's just not, you know, that it's a great fly. Uh, and, and so I would, I wouldn't, uh, I probably wouldn't go out there without having a, a stimulator. It's just that there's some modern bugs to discuss. Um, so those, those are really good guys that have, uh, been fishing in our area for a long time and, and it's still those are still really effective flies and tactics for sure and that stimulator that orange by i mean could that just as easy imitate that that october caddis it would no question uh, i haven't talked to randall yet but i think that'd be a cool to get him on and hear the the history of some of those flies obviously he was a big it's kind of interesting right he was a big influence for a long time and then you know sometimes people disappear um you know, out of the, out of the, the world, it feels like, you know, but, uh, but you're sticking around, right? You've been doing this a while. What's your plan as you, you know, I'm not sure how many years you've been doing this. Um, you know, what is the next say, you know, outlook for you 10 years or so? Look, are you going to keep doing the same? Well, I, I think so. <laughs> um, it's been, it's been awesome. Um, my kids are 14 and 16. Um, I'm getting them to fish around and row around and, um, so that's, uh, I want to make sure that they're, uh, through high school and all set in college. And, um, I, I really like to travel and fish and that's what I've been doing for, for a while. And I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep doing that. I might just do, do a little bit more. Are you guys doing some of the, the trout, just like destination stuff around the world sort of thing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course we had the lodge in New Zealand for seven years. So that was, that was what I did in the winter time from 2013 to 2020. Oh, amazing. Dang, that's a quite a excursion. So you guys had trips um, and then like just set up tricks, books, trips to, to, to the lodge there. Yeah, we had a lot of it. We had, we had some local customers, but I mean, 90, 90 plus percentage of our, our customers were from the United States, but all over nothing, no, no specific location. But I mean, uh, Cedar Lodge was one that um, really had always promoted to the U.S. Uh, clients. And, and so that's, we were, we were open from November 1st to April 1st, roughly. And, um, that was, uh, was purchased by a company called 11 experience in 2000. Yeah. So, yeah, we know 11. I had, um, trying to think we had at least one, one guest talked about them. Yeah. They're they're They got some good stuff going. And so I'm, I'm done with that and, uh, been, and been wintering, um, a little bit in the desert where my daughter plays tennis, uh, but also traveling to fish from there. And yeah, that's the plan for the, for now is to kind of stay at eternal summer. Like once you get hooked on that, it's difficult to, uh, to uh, get away from it. I know that's the thing. When you live in Oregon long enough, you, you kind of have to start to find your summers. You can't, you know, you can only take so much <laughs> rain, right? Exactly. Although man, this year we haven't had any. I know that's the thing. Yeah. It, it, you start to think like, well, maybe, maybe you don't have to go anywhere in the winters as, as this feels like climate change is continuing to keep things warmer and, and less, um, well, I don't know if it's less uh, rain. I think it's the same amount of rain. It's just that it comes in big, pa big batches all at once. That's right. I mean, I think we're due. We're so overdue. Yeah, we're due for a major, a major event. We really are. Yeah, major season. Yeah, it'd be nice to get things moving this uh, this winter. Cool. Well, I think Chris, that's about that's about it for you. Um, I guess we'll direct people out to caddisflyshop.com or the Oregon Fishing Blog if people want to connect with you. That'd be awesome. Okay. Hey, and one last quick one. I, I did want to miss this. We've got a little uh, music, a little random uh, section here. We've got a, a, a blog or a, a Spotify channel for the podcast guest. Do you have a, a, a band or type of music you like to listen to? We could add to the mix. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. Are, are you a big music? Are you more a music guy or more a podcast no, guy? No, no, no. Not at all. Not at all. Um, I'll have to email you that. 
Okay, email it to me. I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> check back with you. Yeah, I'll, we consult, gotta, I'll consult with my music music people here. Yeah, talk to your music. This will be more of a Caddis Fly Shop uh, uh, selection. And right now, if it's at wetflyswing.com slash music, uh, you, we could all go check out. We got a, a good random mix from a bunch. I got to shout out to Chris Chris Santella. He 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 must be the music that I have used, wouldn't he? Has anybody ever used his music? Chris Santella? Yeah. Oh, have you ever had him on a podcast? No. Oh, man, you got to have Chris on. Oh, now, who's Chris? Chris is a just a, a fly fishing musician? No, no, no. Chris is a author of 50 Greatest Places to Fly Fish Before You Die. But that would be the work that we'd be most familiar with, but has written a ton of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that. Definitely. That's a huge, huge book. Okay. He's got a band, and I don't even know what it's called. So, <laughs> but I'll, I'll email you. <laughs> They're good, good. Yeah, everybody. It seems like everybody. There's a lot of people that even Hayfley, right? I don't know if you do. Hayfley used to have a band back in the. I think he played the drums. So cool. I didn't classic. know that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, Chris. Well, I'll let you get out of here. Thanks again for taking the time today and shedding some light on some fall fishing. I hope uh, those people connect with you this fall when this thing gets out. And uh, yeah, man, we'll find some fish. Thanks again. Thank you, Dave. Have a great day. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links and everything else we covered today, head over to wetflyswing.com slash 257, 257. Uh, If you found some help or use or benefit in this podcast, it'd be great if you could leave a review. Uh, You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash L-O-V-E, L-O-V-E, love will get you there and uh, show some love and support for the show. I would appreciate that. That is pretty much a wrap for today. Uh, we had a good time digging in a little bit on the October Caddis from the Caddis Fly Shop. Uh, always fun to talk about that. So hope hope you found some goodness in this one. And uh, just want to say thanks again for being a listener and following us and, and showing your support uh, and taking the time to uh, share this out. That's, that's how we've done it over the years. It's been uh, mostly, I don't know exactly, but I think it's been mostly a word of mouth sort of thing. So I hope to see you on the river, uh, maybe online or uh, maybe in a fly shop. Talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.